Okay, let's take a little closer look at experiments. We learned um, that there's a difference between experiments and observations. Observations, by the name, you're just observing. You're not asking the participants to do anything. You're just watching and recording what's going on. For an experiment, we're going to actually ask them to do something, which we call a treatment. And that's usually some sort of pill we're going to give them, or we're going to ask them to run up the stairs, or we're going to ask them to read a book, or whatever it is we're going to ask them to do. That's what we call a treatment. And what, who, who's doing that, whether it's people or animals or objects, those are the experimental units. Okay? And we're going to observe their response. So if I ask them to run up the stairs and then I measure their heart rate, the response would be the heart rate. Okay? Um... So again, um, a treatment is a specific condition that we're going to apply to the individuals in our experiment. Um, you can have more than one treatment or more than one variable, but a treatment will sh try to show um, the effect on one of those variables. Experimental units are the smallest units of individuals which the treatments are called. Um, usually they're hum when they're humans, we call them subjects, but it doesn't have to be. You can do uh, experimental units on a amoeba or you can do it on a you know a plant or something else of that nature um, so that kind of gets you an idea of what an experiment some of the more technical terms in it um, what, what we happens is we um, when you do an experiment you may have what's called confounding variables we talked about this this isn't a variable that gives you similar results to what your treatment may be but it's lying in there in the background and it's confounding or um, messing up with our results. We can't tell if the results we're getting is because of the treatment we oppose or if it's because of that variable. Okay? Um, bias results when we give it to treatments are given to groups that differ greatly. To get around this problem, we use randomization. I mean, if you use an example, let's say I have this new aspirin. I think this aspirin does a much better job than any aspirin that's out there in the market. Okay, it will um, um, make your headache go away in fewer minutes than any other aspirin out there. Okay, so I'm gonna brand. I'm gonna go out and pick a hundred people, fifty men, fifty women, and I'm gonna uh, um, um, do an experiment on that. Okay, so uh, uh, randomization helps me deal with these confounding variables, and I'll show you both where an example where. There's no randomization involved, and there's one where there is a randomization involved. Okay? So here's my example. Okay? I'm going to pick up my 100 people. Okay? And I'm going to put the 50 men in group one. Figure I'm going to be real organized and make sure I do this experiment well. I'm going to put the 50 women in group two. Okay? I'm going to give the 50 men my. A, a new aspirin and I'm going to give the 50 women the old aspirin and I'm going to try to show that my aspirin is better so I get my results I applied my two treatments I get my results and sure enough group one ha uh, got rid of their headache five minutes faster than group two what's the problem well the problem is I don't know if it's because of the aspirin or if it's because I only had men in this group and women in this group. So is maybe my aspirin does a better job with men than it does with women and that's the reason that my aspirin did better. Overall it may have done just as well as anything else, it just happens to work better with men. Or maybe I my 50 men um, there's something in their bodies that allows them to get rid of headaches quicker than women, whether they had aspirin or not. They would naturally come out quicker. I wouldn't know again if it's the aspirin or if it's because they just happen to be men. So the problem is that I can't tell now. Is it the aspirin or is it the men and women? So this is where I use randomization to help alleviate this problem. So I take my same 100 people now, and instead of putting the 50 men in group 1 and the 50 women in group 2, I flip a queen. Every time a person comes up, heads, they go in group 1. Sorry. And tails, they go in group 2. 
Well, what's going to happen now? Well, more than likely, just the randomization on there, allowing the coin to determine whether the person goes in group one or group two, I'm probably going to split up the males and females pretty equally between the two groups. I'll probably end up with something close to 25 males and 25 females in group one, and something close to 25 males and 25 females in group two. May not be exact, but it certainly is going to be pretty close. I'm not going to end up with 50 men and zero women in group one, and zero men and 50 women in group two. That's not going to happen, I'm assuming my coin is fair. So now, I compare the two treatments, and sure enough, my new aspirin is still five minutes better than my old aspirin. Well, now because of randomization, I've eliminated that confounding variable that occurred because of the men and women. So no longer is it a confounding variable. No longer is it something I have to worry about because I have an equal number of men and women in both groups. So now when my aspirin does better, now I can attribute it to the new aspirin and not because there's males and females. So this is how randomization helps us deal with these confounding variables. We know that they're going to be there. We know that they're going to be around. Sometimes we're going to know where they are. Sometimes we won't. But if we use randomization, then what we're going to do is hope that those confounding variables are balanced between the two groups. And true randomization should do that. Then we can actually look at our experiment, look at our results, and make comparisons and be confident in our answers. So three principles of experimental design. The biggest thing here is randomization. They balance out those confounding variables between the two groups. So the things that you're looking for in experimental design is to control for those lurking variables. So we use some sort of comparative design, whether we give one group a, uh, an aspirin, another group a new aspirin, or we give one group the new aspirin, another group uh, a placebo, which is you know like a sugar pill or something that they think they're taking aspirin, but it really isn't an aspirin. Um, but we control it somehow. We control how we put the treatment in there. Randomization helps us balance out the confounding variables between the two groups so that we can are confident that if there are differences between the two groups it's because of our treatment and not because of the other confounding variables. And the final one is replication. The idea here is that we want to be do make sure our our study is big enough so that um, differences can be distinguished from chance differences between the groups. In other words if we do this with just two people in here then differences might just be the result of the two people. One person had a stronger headache than the other. But if you do this with a hundred people, then we can show that, yeah, our aspirin is, does a better job overall because we're going to have 50 people uh, in both groups and maybe 20 of them in each group have really strong headaches, the other 30 not so strong. It still should show us um, that one aspirin does better than the other. Okay, so that kind of gives you a, a, an example of how experimental designs are done and certainly how randomization is such a key aspect of experiments.